start recording and I'm going to admit everyone at 6 p.m. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome, good people. I'm Carolina Wheat, curator at Art Fair. And tonight I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, another artist on Art Fair named B. Quinn. Welcome. Hi there. It's so nice to see you. Um, I really appreciate you're inviting me to do this uh, conversation tonight. It's a, a great opportunity and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Carolina. No, of course, of course. There actually seems like there's a little bit of a delay that's all of a sudden um, mm -hmm. on your end of things. Am I okay? Are, are, are my lips synced to <laughs> what I'm saying? Yes. Hmm. Oh, I am frozen. Let's, let me. Well, we can um, certainly just keep the gab and then. Uh, Maybe that's better. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Did it. <laughs> very, very well done. <laughs> well, again, you know, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate where you're set right now. It's like you're in this little nook. Um, it's like the perfect Zoom land space. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so this is uh, the nook I was uh, mentioning earlier that I think in this uh, vintage building that I live in that a lot of these spaces used to have fireplaces in them. And so um, this unit was taken out. So I kind of use it as an at-home workspace. So I've got the bookshelves and my monitor and a desk behind me. So yeah, it's where I can set up and kind of draw and do some video work and editing. Yeah, so thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's perfect. And you're based in Chicago now, you're back in Chicago, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm back in Chicago. Um, I live on the north side. Um, and yeah, I, I've been back for um, a little over a month or so. Um, so I had previously been away for a while for my Fulbright residency, which was in Vienna, Austria. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it's nice to be home and kind of get settled back in to the groove of things here in the city. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so you were, were you over there then through um, the, 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 the pandemic? Um, no, not the entire pandemic. So it's interesting that I was originally um, scheduled to be in Vienna um, when the pandemic first started. So I was supposed to uh. be at the Q21 residency last spring. Um, and more or less the week that I was scheduled to leave was when everything kind of shut down. So um, it had been pushed back. So I was there this past spring um, for a little over two months, um, April and May. Um, so as a resident at the museum quarter, and so it's an international residency um, where they usually host around eight artists at a time. Oh, okay, wonderful. That's fantastic. And then it was Fulbright sponsored. Yes, yeah. So the, the funding and the affiliation, um, I, I being an American there was through Fulbright. And so a lot of the other artists had um, comparable fellowships from some different other organizations um, across Europe um, that were funding their residencies. Uh, but, but, you know, you asked about the quarantine, so it was kind of interesting that uh, when I first got to Vienna, things were like partially open. So some museums and galleries had just recently opened, but um, things were still kind of uh, a lot strict in term, stricter in terms of like food and, and grocery protocol and trains and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but then they ended up, you know, they were taking things really seriously and trying to really increase the amount of people that were vaccinated and so they did um, actually end up putting the whole city back on lockdown um, for a little over a month so that was kind of an interesting thing to kind of have to adjust to being in the new place and then readjust to a lockdown in a different city yeah yeah that's quite complicated I'm just frankly surprised that you were able to go over there and you know even through like of random or lockdowns that were happening. We had about three, I mean, we were basically in New York, we were pretty um, quarantined for months, um, very seriously for the first three, March, April, May, June. Um, and I can't even imagine going anywhere. Um, and in the summertime, of course, it, it, it lifted up some of those restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, 
I'm really glad that you were able to even go because, you know, I've got uh, friends that have family in Italy or family mm-hmm. in, in, in France, and they haven't been able to leave the country to even go visit family. So having, you know, the opportunity to be sponsored. and, and Yeah, and, I, I was really grateful. And it was something that was kind of really still felt really, really tentative, you know, even into the new year um, in terms of whether the residency was going to be open. Um, so yeah, because yeah. of all of those restrictions, it was a lot more complicated than originally anticipated. So having to get um, a higher level of visa and clearances and all the testing and all, you know, extra, right. extra steps of, uh, you know, bureaucratic administration. But yeah, it was, it was still a great experience. Um, and I think too, like I've mentioned to some other folks while talking about the experience, I think because of the quarantine and because of COVID, the actual cohort of Fulbright scholars that were there, some independent scholars, not necessarily just artists, Mm. but we had kind of started um, a little bit of our own communication on our own over email and WhatsApp. And so that kind of network was really nice to have, again, being really isolated because typically as most people, you know, they've been to an artist residency or have talked to artists about residencies, part of the appeal is you know, yes, having the time and space to focus on your work, but you do want that kind of element of community and meeting other artists or curators. Um, And that was really challenging, you know, again, because of the lockdown and just where the world has been at, you know, the past year. Um, So yeah, so I was really grateful to have kind of those extra connections and meet some people from other fields, you know, in, in addition to the artists who were there. Absolutely. I mean, Fulbright comes with quite reputation and I know that it's very bureaucratic yet, you know, the, I'm just, I'm extremely impressed that they followed through and um, it's, it's, it's really nice. I wanted to mention everyone uh, again, thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, throw it in the chat. I'm happy to um, share that with B. Quinn um, as we move along here and talk more about your work. And when you were in Austria, um, were you pursuing uh, a particular body of work or um, I know what's on the app right now, the banal déjà vu, Mm -hmm. those pieces are um, really compelling to me. They're, they, they feel uh, a little sketchy at times, but they, but as you use the, but they seem very worked as well. There's like these two nice uh, feelings of gesture as well as there's order but then there's chaos within that you know with the mark making and so there's um they're really nice and they're really nice price point too uh and so when i was discovering your work uh, i saw them and um they're really fantastic and i I saw that they were shipping from austria Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i need to update that now not anymore yeah (laughs) i think we shipped from chicago Mm -hmm. but were you uh focusing on those there or what were you working on when you were um at the residency yeah so i mean that's a really great question so that particular body of work that is on art fair um if you look closely at the dates it's something that i actually had started um a little over 10 years ago when I was in undergrad um, at SAIC. And so that work had kind of grown out of um, kind of like working with numbers and text and like looking at people like um, Roman Apolka or Ankawara and and also um, working with, you know, you, you've spent time in Chicago, someone like Barbara Rossi, right? And really thinking about invention and kind of outsider artists and stream of consciousness, right? So taking the idea of like automatic writing and automatic drawing and making it my own. Um, So those are things that I kind of had spent time doing uh, during quarantine and kind of really got back into that is to have more of a at home studio practice while working on, uh, you know, a lot of video editing, which is what um, I've kind of been was consumed by for uh, a really large period of time in the last year or so. Um, so those I can kind of come in and out of doing, you know, I think like right. it's typical for artists to have maybe be known or be working on a larger scale project, but then we always kind of have things that are not to diminish them because I think that they, I, I am flattered and thank you for finding them compelling because for me, there's this element of time and gesture that, you know, the, the way that they're composed. Um, so they are records of time, right? Cause it's like I finished, they're all, only made like the day that, you know, using the dates of the day that they're made. Um, but I think that the time and gesture, despite, you know, working with a lot of other kind of content um, are kind of consistently present, you know, as things I'm thinking about in the work. So when I was in Austria, um, 
you know, the original proposal had been hinged and kind of focused around um, a larger scale project that I had, you know, because again, with the bureaucracy of Fulbright, you apply and it's, you know, over a year or two until you actually make it to where you're going to do your research. So um, the piece that I had been starting on at the time of uh, applying to Fulbright is called the haircut. And so I was really focused on the representation of women in media and specifically um, had become interested in the representation of women in film and moving image and this idea of gesture and kind of body and transformation. And so then to then be asked like, well, how does that relate to Vienna? And like, why would that be a location that you would want to visit? And so I was kind of thinking about Fulbright as an opportunity to, to then kind of look outside of the studio and look outside of that research and kind of look more in the world because that is something that I um, am kind of wanting to move forward in even here now that I'm back in Chicago, which is coming from research about, you know, women's rights and, you know, femicide and, you know, abuse and trauma and, and the systems that are in place to actually help women. And so Austria and, and Vienna, it is, is a really interesting place in that they are, really focused on the arts and it's a, you know, it's a clean city and everybody's kind of happy and the family unit is really kind of um, uplifted and celebrated. Um, but they have an interesting history in terms of how women are treated there. And I was really compelled by the fact that the UN conference um, where, you know, we hear the phrase that women's rights are human rights was actually held in Vienna, Austria in the early nineties. And then as I was reading about just how women have lived through the political system and the the welfare system there, you know, there's just some really strange things <laughs> that have gone on there still, despite kind of their forward or, you know, progressiveness in certain areas that in other areas, they're very conservative and behind. So I was like very curious to kind of maybe connect with some women's rights organizations and other artists. And there's some interesting kind of like female driven curatorial groups that are there. So that was the original plan, but then enter COVID. And so I think that for artists or performers or anyone that wants to kind of be out in the world, it really shut a lot of those doors when I found out that I was going to be there, you know, this spring. So it kind of became this thing where I'm like, it was a year past where I thought I'd be in the way that I work. Um, you know, things are kind of really conceptually informed, but still there's a, a high level of intuitive exploration that happens. So that's, you know, looking back at that drawing series, you know, that they are based in intuition and they're not pre-planned. Um, so I kind of let each project inform <clears throat> where I'm going with my research. And so I really kind of didn't want to do the easy thing, which would be like, oh, I'll just, you know, continue that and scale it back or I'll compromise and do something that's easy and just, you know, make these drawings. Um, and so I, I started thinking, well, you know, what can I do when I'm kind of isolated? And, you know, I really love to read, um, really love to take walks. So really early on in the residency, I was just doing that. And I was working on those drawings and also working on um, a series of drawings that kind of comes from, again, another project um, where in the past I've done like some more realistic renderings of objects that are used by hand, again, for gesture and transformation. So um, sewing needles, knives, um, guns. And so I was, I had this pair of scissors that I was kind of obsessively drawing, you know, while I was thinking like, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, I need to start new work. Um, and after having worked on the haircut, this, you know, the video project, which the research and the editing of that was, you know, close to two years. Epic. Um, yeah, it was a really, <laughs> you know, intense project, but that's how, how, how it works for me sometimes. Um, so I was familiar with uh, Avini's uh, fiction writer, um, Ingrid Bachman. And so, but the, the only writing of hers that I really had been familiar with was her uh, novel, Melina. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I knew about that. And so I was like, I'm gonna start doing some research on other Austrian, you know, women fiction writers um, and ended up finding a really great small bookstore there that had a lot of English text. And so this was before things went back on lockdown. Um, and I went in like my list of, of, of people and um, had a great conversation with the woman who was working and she was, you know, Austrians, it can be a little cold, but she started warming up to me and we ended up having this really great conversation. Um, and at one point you know, she just was bringing over like stacks of books to me with her suggestions. And I kind of was like picking through them. 
And so, I, you know, we had a great exchange and I, I left there with a, a fair amount of reading material and really kind of dived um, hard into Ingrid Bachman's poetry and short stories. And one of the things that was really compelling for me about her is again, she's not someone who's maybe as well known. Um, this novel Molina was recently kind of republished with like an intro by Rachel Kushner. And so like there's, you know, kind of getting more attention. Um, but, you know, she was born in the early twenties and was kind of really writing in like a post-World War II Vienna and was mm -hmm. a contemporary of a uh, Austrian um, fiction writer and playwright, Thomas Bernhard, who was someone I had read kind of in early in college and was always really excited by his work and tend to revisit it every few years. So to kind of learn that there was this connection between them and then really get into her writing, um, I just really started thinking about her characters and the representation of her, the, the storytelling of the women and her short stories and her poetry was super compelling. And I think, again, um, you know, I, I mentioned in another conversation once that I'm like, after kind of coming out of this really like, kind of like so strictly research-based project where I was like looking at like close to 700 films, finding scenes with, you know, women having haircuts happening and so much on the computer and research and organizing all that data. And then the time that it takes to edit it, I really was like, well, I kind of want to have a little bit more freedom and kind of, I think be, yeah, and a little bit more of that abstract space, um, which is fun and I like that, but it can also be kind of stressful to, to be in that I'm starting from scratch mode, you know, I think for any artist, even though you're never really starting from scratch, right? Because you've got all the work you've mm -hmm. done behind you that's kind of pushing you. But I think to kind of trust that, for me, that was a challenge, um, but really exciting. And I, you know, I was really invigorated by her um, and this other uh, female writer, I'm just gonna make sure I say her name correctly, Friedrich Mayrocker, um, who also, um, so she, Friedrich Mayrocker is still living and working uh, now. And she, I think the thing too, like with the three women who I was focused on, kind of work in a realm of auto fiction, you know, so they're, they're not just writing about themselves, but they're drawing on their own experiences. And even with Ingrid Bachman, when I was reading her short stories, I was kind of like, oh, I want to know what her connection to Rome is, you know, because it's like Rome was like popping up in like these stories. And then even in the poetry, it's like, you know, when you're reading like someone's whole kind of catalog of all the poems that they've written, you start to pick up on the patterns and the language and started wondering you're like, why is red one of the only colors, you know, that's ever mentioned in these poems? Um, so things like that really got me excited about the idea of personal narrative and then excited by the landscape of the city. Um, and after having been looking at film and working with that, you know, really large kind of experimental film project, I was just like, I, I want to work with moving image and I want to do something time-based. And so, um, thinking about it, but then also, again, so many of these texts and poems were about memory. Um, I chose to actually work with high eight um, camcorder. So I, I, you know, I'm not trained in film. I have worked with some, you know, small, short time-based pieces in the past. So mm -hmm. I feel like for me, most of my work is not ever really necessarily about being super technically correct from the get-go. I think it's always more about the idea and then the material and just figuring out a way to make it happen. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of an adventure, you know, on the <laughs> Austrian Craigslist, uh, trying to find a high eight or like a, a video camcorder um, because I didn't want to get, I, not that I wanted to purposely make it difficult, but I, I really like the way that that looks and how I think that in our kind of vernacular of media, just it represents a certain time right and it's like it, yes. it's a personal thing where it's like you know late 90s early 2000s like that's what families were using or you would take that on vacation or you would shoot a birthday party or you'd go on vacation right and bring that back um so I like that you know as what that media is um it, it is not without its challenges <laughs> So, you know, I, I did end up finding a camera and on eBay and going to meet the person. And, you know, that was its own mm -hmm. fun thing. Um, and then going to buy like dead stock box of high eight tapes from someone also off of, you know, Austrian Craigslist. Um, yeah, and then just starting to kind of play around with it and actually have fun. And I think that 
you know, I try to take my own advice that I give to some of my colleagues, you know, when they're feeling frustrated or thinking about new work is just to sometimes just kind of lean into the not knowing um, and actually enjoy experimenting. And so mm -hmm. I did that. Um, well, that's and, something and that I'm certainly drawn to even, um, you know, back with the banal deja vu, uh, the process by which that you are intuitive and that you're basically you know, capturing whatever you're channeling, uh, perhaps, you know, this automatic writing or this automatic mm -hmm. drawing. Um, it actually is reminiscent to me when you were talking about you know, taking a walk and thinking um, on that particular date. I'm very super fan of Jorhinde Voigt's work. Mm -hmm. um, she, she just kind of reminds me, the, the work doesn't exactly read like Jorhinde's, yet it does have a similar um, path towards the process where the process is very intuitive, although there's an order to the to the chaos by way of their own conventions of each step to the beach or each step down the stairs, mm -hmm. stairs to the space. And, um, you know, there that willingness to let yourself just almost not think just just be mm -hmm. meditatively in repetition drawing and doing these things um i i'm 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 particularly drawn to as yours you know as as these works as i said before yet it's it's nice to hear you speak about this high eight um these vignettes as you would mm -hmm. uh, uh that you're working on and how it was informed by, um, you know, a poet. Do you have any examples that we can see, any uh, clips or anything that we could really hone in on? Um, from about? oh, from Vienna. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great question, and I actually was considering that. Um, I do unfortunately cannot show something right now. That's okay. Um, so I'm in the process, and so this is kind of was also like a, a kind of a point that I reached when I was there. So coming, working with the older media form, you know, the limitations of the technology. And so um, despite the fact that when I was doing the haircut piece, you know, I had sourced all of these different films from many different things. And at sure, one point was actually kind mm -hmm. of ready and what had been thinking like, okay, what if I can't find something digitally and I have to convert a VHS. So like that was something that had been on my radar like when I was working on that project. And I did get pretty lucky like out of the research that was done for that piece, which like I mentioned, there was like, I think a little over 700 films that I found that have scenes, wow. but then what I was able to actually source to create the work. Um, I think I ended up at, I think a little under 600. So it's like maybe like five, 80 ish or something. Uh, and then you had said it's about 18 hours long mm -hmm. haircut piece. Yeah, yeah. So it's 18 hours long with all of those scenes, but the majority of them were, I was able to access them online. Um, there were some that I had to buy, like, you know, order special DVDs, things that were like really obscure and not able to be sourced, you know, on Pirate Bay or things like that. Um, right. So, so that's an area that I never thought I'd become an expert in, but I can kind of find almost anything, I think, on the internet now. Um, well, do even you, did you have to think about rights and copyright issues then, B? I mean, um, you, yeah, so you that's, it's, a really, it's a really great question. And I kind of love kind of answering that because um, I think a thing that artists do oftentimes when you, especially working with um, you know appropriation as a form of, of making art, is you just kind of, for me at least, like I look to some other artists and kind of look for permission, even if I I know what I'm doing is right and, and it's creating new work. Um, but, but with that particular piece, I think like I was really informed um, and really referencing like Mark Clay's The Clock, um, mm, you know, sure. which, I, which I'm lucky and I was able to see the year um, that that was shown in Venice when he won the Silver Lion for it. And I thought, oh wow you know, if this dude can do it, I can do it. Like, and so I actually did do um, a lot of research and a, a close friend of mine who was my video editor, like assistant, who was actually trained in film, who, who really like kind of 
helped me learn a lot about editing. I remember one of our first conversations that we had <laughs> before I started editing was just like reviewing copyright laws and reviewing intellectual, you know, property things and just to be like, you're informed and you have the information. But to be honest, like Mark Clay didn't buy any of those films and did not pay for any rights. And so kind of the, the guidelines, I think with working with moving image in terms of creating this piece that essentially is in a way a hypercut, but I think truly True. does transform the content into a much larger kind of succinct body, you know, or object of, of work in a way, even though it's theoretically mm -hmm. material, right? Because it's, it's mm -hmm. film or it's video, um, is that you, I could sell the work, <laughs> but I can't charge um, like an admission fee. So like if when gotcha. MoMA or if, if I was showing, if the piece was being shown at an institution, mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't charge a special ticket price for it. So like you could get it with your general admission, but they couldn't, like, you know how like the Art Institute, sometimes gotcha. if you want to see Monet, you've got to pay yep. the extra. You just can't do that. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the realm of, I think how that piece exists. You know, is that, I mean, I'm actually in part of, eventually I would, I had um, put together a proposal to actually, I would hope to one day make a book that references that work. Um, because again, it's conceptual. I don't expect someone to sit down and watch all 18 hours of it. I obviously have more than once. Oh my gosh. Um, but there's so much amazing content that's there. And I think also, as much as it's about the representation of women and this kind of the, you know, the trope of the haircut and how that has been used in storytelling and in film to represent so many different types of mindsets or, you know, cliche scenarios for a woman, um, you know, it's unrealistic maybe that someone would watch it all and a, a huge two volume book is still a lot, but at least it would be something that you could then kind of easily see some of the imagery and, I think too, like the way that I work, um, I do like a lot of artists that work with appropriation and it's not the first time that I myself have worked with that as a strategy. Mm. Um, but I also think that like, unlike maybe someone like Richard Prince who doesn't want to maybe acknowledge sources or things like that, um, I plan on you know being like very transparent because again, I think the research is also interesting. So I think that seeing the statistics of the years that, you know, where the films were made and who were the actors or actresses in the films, you know, and, and what was kind of the, the character. So I think, you know, I, I acknowledge, you know, that I am in a way indebted to those filmmakers or the people who, who created those films. Um, but as an artist that we do have, you know, that's kind of the great thing about being an artist is you can kind of really use whatever you want in terms of media you know, to kind of create your work. And so yeah. when you were thinking about the compilation and it's as its own cohesive work itself, even though it's, you know, piecemeal together, well, how are your transitions and um, what, what are you doing um, throughout the compilation to best kind of express the varied, cliches of women cutting their mm -hmm. hair like how or perhaps maybe we can watch a short example I know it's 18 hours we don't have that time like do you have a, a a clip with a transition that we might be able to watch or yeah so I I think just to kind of quickly answer that and then yeah we can bring up an excerpt um so the way that the the work is actually composed is again um, time is an element that drives the organization of the work. So as the scenes were being sourced, um, you know, I have this massive spreadsheet document where the timestamp for where a scene would fall in a film was recorded. And so really what I did is then I used those timestamps to then data sort and kind of organize all of the, all of the scenes. And so in a way you have this kind of very, very repetitious narrative of this this action or this gesture happening in different types of forms, you know, throughout all these different scenes that are edited together. But then you also have kind of this examination of the structure of a film, right? And so some of the opening scenes, you can see credits, you know, the, the, the text and things that are happening while a haircut is happening because this is the beginning of a movie. Um, and then also throughout, you know, so you, there's kind of like an energy, I think, in terms of, you know, 
how the scenes play out. Um, but yeah, the editing was really intense because I think, you know, I'm, I have a background as a painter and I'm very particular about how things line up and have worked with sound before. And so for me, um, sound was actually a really, really big part of the editing process of where I would decide to kind of cut something or how to line something up. Mm. And I did try to remain true to kind of like those, you know, the time stamps there's a few exceptions where you know I would see something and be like okay actually like you know there's there's there someone is walking upstairs in this scene and downstairs in this thing that's two scenes from now and so I think like there are still like definitely a, many 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 aesthetic decisions that have been made to create that film so that there's a flow so that if you walk in and you sit down and you watch it for 30 minutes or five minutes it's going to still have um, a continuity to it that's very intentional. Um, and I think that's what I'm really excited about with that piece is that you can walk in and watch, you know, a handful of scenes or you could watch an hour of content. And there is um, kind of so much variety, but then consistency within the variety of the tropes of the scenes, right? Where it's like, I could have made a piece that was just about nun haircuts, you know, or just about... <laughs> kidnapping haircuts right so I mean there's mm. all of these like sub genres within these films um so but something that I can bring up um and also for everyone that's watching um the full work is not able to be streamed online right now um but on my website which I'll do a screen share um there's the original kind of 10 minute excerpt that I had put together when I was working on proposals and kind of Mm -hmm. fleshing out the beginning of the concept um and so it's like a really early version of the work um but still remains very dear to me because I think even in this uh smaller clip there's a variety uh, of types of films and I think too um that's again like I said seeing parts of films but then also as like kind of a reflection of just film history is really cool and just seeing how you know things have changed over because I think the oldest scene is from like 1911 yeah, wow. which is pretty wild. Yeah, so I can do a screen share. Um, and no. do we want to watch a couple minutes of this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And this is your. This is. Is it? Is it finished yet, B? Oh or, yeah, B? yeah, it's finished. So it was actually finished um, earlier this year. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and it had. It was like close. It was originally going to be done before I left last spring, and then it was one benefit of COVID um, was having extra time. So I was able to do additional research and really invest a lot of time in the editing process. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I ended up with a better version of it had COVID maybe not happened. So I think that's, you know, I can say that's a positive thing for me, um, but it is done and it's ready to go. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, so let's do that. Is this meant to have sound? Oh, yes. Can you not hear sounds? No. Okay. Um, mm. If you uh, stop sharing your screen and then pull up that box again, then optimize for um, share sound and optimize video clip. You just have to click it before you. Um, in that same when it gives me the oh advanced got it yep so it's like you'll see desktop one or whatnot and then on the bottom left share sound and optimize for video clip can you see those little check yeah boxes? i got it i oh, got perfect. it now sweet thank you okay oh how you have deceived me and in a fit of anger she seized a pair of scissors and cut off those long, wonderful golden braids.
disqualified at the end when they find out you're a girl. You'll have to forfeit the prize money and even send you to prison for fraud. But if there's any trouble, you tell them it was me that did it, you understand? It was me that put you up to it. It was my idea. I made you do it. There won't be any trouble, Mike. If you're going to ride, there's a lot of tricks of the race you'll have to learn. Don't worry about the start. Get off as fast as you can and then jump sure and clean. Yes, Mike. And uh, you go twice around the course, that's three jumps in all. Yes, Mike. I might as well start at the beginning. The first jump is a just a clean head Mike. jump. Mike. I know the order of the jumps and the tricks of the race. Why, there's a lot to know. It's no use. Everyone riding out there tomorrow will know more than I do. It's no use, Mike. Do you think a race like this is won by luck? No. By knowing the pie can win and telling him so. was that last movie? I don't think oh, I've ever seen that. Uh, so that's actually from The Holy Mountain. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is a film from the 70s and it is really, really intense and very long. Um, and I, if you're into films, I definitely suggest watching it. It's um, by, again, I'm trying to, um, Jodorowsky, um, Jodorowsky. Sure. is his last name yeah um and was shot i believe in mexico and there's like a lot of controversy i think it had to be shot there just because they're using a lot of like animal carcasses and things in it yeah so it's it's, a, it's like a surrealist type of film it's like it's like my short anecdote <laughs> about yeah, it totally. to describe it yeah well it felt very ritualistic there and, and, mm -hmm. and even sounds uh it's like I'm just watching Midsummer or something like this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, that does. That's a really nice compilation, and it just uh, reigns true. And you know, when GI Jane is on there, and Demi Moore is that? I think that's mm -hmm. what it is. Um, yeah. That was such an iconic scene. I remember being in high school, and that film came out, and everyone was all the rage. Like, she did. She shaved her head on camera. She shaved her, head. and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly we could, you know, go down the rabbit hole in relationship to like a Britney Spears shaving her head or right. like 
the implications of a woman taking that hair away. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, it's very conceptually you know, interesting to really consider the types of um, stigma that uh, women get for having short hair, having mm-hmm. shaved head, um, and otherwise where, you know, that femininity is kind of taken away and, and, the, and the, you know, it's, it's really a, a longer conversation for many, many days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see how the power within the haircut can be um, just a, a much more, um, much more than just these clips together, you know, as, as you're creating your work is very feminist. And um, yeah, it, it, it really drives it home, I think, without saying too much, just, mm-hmm. just by the compilation. But you're, I mean, you've shown a documenta prior as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so it was through a collaboration. So the group Critical Art Ensemble okay. um, had actually done a really cool thing. So they were kind of like the headliners, right? And so um, they're very much like kind of like a, social justice, um, very like site responsive, kind of politically driven, but really fascinating group. Um, And so, yeah, the year that they were invited to be in Documenta, they actually then opened up their position and invited other artists to apply um, to be in Documenta with them. Um, And so that was a a really exciting opportunity. And actually, um, so we were each given a day to kind of present work. Um, And so with the opportunity that I had is I did actually present um, a short time-based work and a sound-based work. So kind of almost in a way putting them together kind of as like a time-based diptych, um, which was really um, fascinating and kind of fun for me because that the work that I, that I showed, it's called How to Forgive. And this was a piece that um, was really only the second kind of video or like edited piece that I had made and it was kind of riffing off of the first one that I had done, which was a combination of photo Roman and moving video. Mm. So that it's kind of like a photographic collage, right? So it's like, it's taking still images and timing it so that it appears, you know, as if it's moving like video work. And so I had done that for a piece um, at SAIC when I was an undergrad that was in response to a particular painting called The Death of the Poet Walter Reiner. And then while I was in Vienna um, the following year doing an an internship actually at the um, Biennale, I was kind of, it was the way that the piece that I showed at Documenta came up was it was actually because of a failed, kind of like a failed attempt at another project Mm -hmm. um, where I was trying to do this kind of like Oh, maybe like reminds me of like Yoko Ono or like Sophie Cal was like trying to like interact with people like in Vienna where I had these flyers that I had made and I was really trying to ask people this question like you know how do you forgive someone or like how do you forgive right and so I had these flyers and I was like passing them out and it's it's really interesting like in terms of performance because I don't think of myself as a performance artist but I think many times in the work, there is kind of this idea of like kind of private performance that happens in the studio or in in making the work. Um, And yeah, so it really wasn't going as I expected and I was really frustrated. And some of my colleagues um, who were like, more like arts writers or or curators at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm like, I'm just gonna start, they had had like an email address on them for people to respond. So I was like, I'm just gonna start leaving them around the city. And so so it's again, this example almost of, kind of how I was thinking about Vienna when I was away recently is just like the city as a character and the spaces as something to respond to. And so this good friend of mine um, was just following me around with her cell phone camera, you know, taking pictures of me leaving this flyer in different places and then actually going through, um, you know, parts of the Biennale and leaving it, you know, on the floor of Boltanski's installation or on top of a Thomas Hirschhorn or, you know, and just kind of really, situating this work, yeah, for 24 hours, just just like, you know, and I wasn't hurting anything, I wasn't being disrespectful, but I think that that's also kind of a tension that I've always been interested in. Again, I think it's like, I know I mentioned that I have the background as a painter and people that are close to me will will laugh and groan where I'm kind of like, oh, I, I, I still kind of struggle with that, right? Where it's like the idea of 
you know, the white cube and kind of the politics of what it means to like be an art capital A and be dependent on that system and that structure to show or to present your work, even though we, we do have the, the great excitement and luxury of seeing artists who have are obviously beyond that right, but that are still featured in those spaces. But I think for me, like the instinct was always like even as an undergrad before I was in Chicago was to kind of push back and and I and to this day I still question it right it's like I get it I understand kind of the relationship the symbiosis the artists have with these systems um but for me that is something that's part of what kind of drives me is just kind of questioning that so that was really fun because I ended up not really getting answers to the question but then had all of this kind of great documentation and a great I think experience of being like I'm going to do this thing for 24 hours and then I'll figure out what to do with it afterwards and so I ended up editing together those pictures along with my own video footage that I had been taking you know of the water of different things in Vienna um, and then similar to the Walter Reiner piece um, using music to then edit the still images. And so again, I, I kind of come back to mentioning that sound and time, you know, is always kind of present in the work. Um, so yeah, so using the structure of sound to kind of edit the still images along with the moving images. Um, and it was, it was really exciting. And so I think those are two very early works of mine um, that I think were, you know, strong, even though they're from like post, you know, before grad school. Um, that's still fairly very relevant to me now, I think, with yes. the to work with the footage from Vienna because you had asked if I could show anything. And part of the reason why I can't yet is that I'm in the process of actually, I can show you guys the actual physical tapes. I pulled them out. Nice. So these are 10, there's one that's not here. So there's 11 that's in the camera, um, is to, to digitize these. Ah. Um, so that is, it's something I figured out, but now I'm, I've reached a little bit of a hiccup because a lot of the footage that I want to use once I kind of figured out what the plan, the loose plan was, is I started shooting in 16.9 on the camcorder okay. and a mm -hmm. lot of the hardware that's available to digitize, there's some uh, technical restrictions and that it only wants to translate it in that original camcorder form so it's cropping things so stay uh, tuned I'll oh that's a challenge How, and each yeah, one it's always a learning those, experience sorry go ahead minutes, were those tapes 60 minutes of footage on each of those tapes yeah or? so each each tape is 60 minutes yeah and kind of the way that I was working was early on when I first got the camera and was still kind of doing a lot of reading and also writing and, and drawing um was just kind of learning for me to get comfortable with the camera and shooting in the studio that I was living and going out and experimenting. Um, and then, yeah, once, you know, I had kind of come up with this idea where I was like, okay, I just finished this kind of ridiculous 18 hour epic installation video piece. Um, let's look up and see what the guidelines are for a short film <laughs> or like what, you know, what, what would fall into that category. And so I kind of was using that idea of like, I'm going to, I want to make a piece that's at least one of the works that will come from what I shot will be about 30 minutes or so. And, and again, using time and the idea of repetition as a structure to kind of then eventually take the poetics of what I was shooting. And so, like I mentioned the idea of auto fiction and how a lot of these you know, women were writing about other women or using themselves as characters in their poetry and the storytelling um, in response to landscape and their day-to-day -day activities. And so I was doing a lot of um, shots in the studio apartment, like the workspace that I was living, as well as out in the city. And I kind of came up with like this routine where I was repeating shots every day. So it was kind of like I had these really um, interesting, like the blinds on my windows were almost like the, you know, the backdrop for like a film in a way. So everyday morning and night shots of that opening and closing and then just kind of routines in the house and again um, something that I think I, I have always kind of responded to in the time-based work as well as in sculptural work is, is materials you know water and things that, that's transformed there's other shots of the shower and like the tea kettle but really minimal um, and then the one location that I kind of revisited a lot was the Belvedere Gardens um, and that was somewhere I had visited um, the very first time I was in Vienna for a school kind of study trip um, that I found really compelling, like aesthetically, it's romantic. Uh, it's as weird, like the place itself has like an interesting history, but I like the fact that 
despite its like palatial qualities, it's a place that's really accessible for people there, you know, and they're also similar to Chicago, lots of parks. Um, and this idea of routine of like someone going there and like maybe they're going there to wait for someone or they're going there to think about someone. And so how just through these simple gestures of repetition, I could start to have like an implied narrative. And so that's kind of the idea that was like starting to drive that video work. But again, like still, still very experimental. And I think um, as I've started reviewing some of the footage, despite some of the limitations of conversion, um, just even looking at some of the early footage there, I already have like one or two other pieces earmarked that I'm like, oh, I'm gonna use this for its own piece. This will be something separate. So it's it's really exciting to kind of now be back and have had a little bit of space away from the, the time at the residency um, and to begin, you know, to begin to review the footage and think about actually, you know, working with it. Definitely. Yeah, the that that's a, always so exciting. And I'm certain that you know you're gonna find so many hidden treasures, um, even once the 30 minutes minimal repetitive, you know, um work that you're aiming towards. Uh, as you said, you already have like a couple other ideas going mm -hmm. on. I mean, that's a lot of footage and um it's 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 probably a pain, yeah, to to transfer it all, but uh it's definitely well worth it. And I appreciate too, you know, there was a work that um, you had done something around, it's like the devil's chariots. Oh yeah, so that's another. I'm, I'm in interested, progress. yeah, because because you keep referring to, you know, these personal narratives or these mm -hmm. narratives, um, you know, female, um, represent, you know, representing female um, mm -hmm. kind of stories. And that one was really compelling to me too, because you know we don't talk about women's anger so much, right? And this mm -hmm. whole entire compilation was was really about women's anger. And we talk about some, you know, sometimes we'll talk about rage, I suppose, or mm -hmm. craziness, or you know, a woman when they're angry is you know, you know, when you don't want to mess with her. Totally, but, um, yeah, yeah. And I just was hoping maybe I mean we've got like eight minutes left. And I know if anyone has any questions, please throw them in the chat. But I was wondering if you could just address that uh, project a little bit. Completely. Yeah. And sorry, I'm actually just, I'm pulling a book from the stack that my computer's on just to make you laugh. Oh. <laughs> so yes, you're, okay. you're reading my mind. Um, and I'm glad <laughs> you asked about that work. So it's funny. I was actually just speaking about that project this morning when I was like, talking about the upcoming to-do list of, of things to do. So it's like convert video, start working on tidying up the plans for the show that I have in New York in October. Oh yeah, air, that's coming up this fall, right? Yeah, so that's in October and that was originally gonna be in February. And so it's kind of gotten pushed back. So as well, it, you know, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I'm super excited to come to New York. Um, I love this space. It's such a great organization. It is. Um, but then I also mentioned, yeah, the Ordesecker, the Devil's Chariot uh, project, because I have to start translating the Hungarian novel so that yeah. I can work on that. <laughs> so yeah, no shortage of projects um, going on here. But yeah, so the, the kind of vision for that is that it will ultimately also be based in video and video installation and sculptural installation and possibly some drawings. But yeah, the concept there actually, you know, it is informed by like, I'd say two things. Like one, the fact that I have worked with some Hungarian translation. Um, my mom's family is from there. And so it was, you know, taking language classes and, and working on that. Um, and through that kind of journey found this really weird novel about um, this two cousins the before that were from the Bathory family who are actually related to Elizabeth Bathory, who was this Hungarian, you know, aristocrat um, countess, who is kind of recognized as the first female serial killer. And so that story and kind of, you know, that weird time period and, and how just bizarre and like intense and, and fascinating in like all kinds of horrible ways was, curious to me after work on the haircut piece because one of the things that I kind of took away after reviewing all these scenes and all this footage and something that I hadn't expected to see um, and if you go back to my, the website that actual next scene where I had cut off this the 10 minute excerpt that we were watching oh yeah um, was one of the first scenes that I saw that it was female on female violence so something that was surprising to me that as like a sub narrative you know was 
just yeah the the action of a woman like cutting another was a woman's hair or attacking her or humiliating her so that as a narrative really became interesting to me specific because like you said women and anger it is a really fascinating topic where it's like thinking about again going back to other projects thinking about women and femicide and women who have been silenced um that a lot of times that it's much more societally accepted for a woman to be sad than to be angry you know mm. so so that is something you know where again it's like there's a long list of people who I've been starting to read and that, you know, who are experts, you know, in sociology and, and feminist and, and gender studies who are writing about this. But I think that all of these things, you know, they, they are permeating our, you know, it's in our culture, right? And these are things that are reinforced by the way that women are represented and the way that stories are told, right? And Absolutely. you can go back to something, you know, not that it's simple, but like something like the Bechtel test, right? It's like, the, it's like one thing that's, it's not about anger, right? But it's about how are women's stories told and how are women able to speak, right? And that's not just in media, it's also in our day-to-day -day relationships, in the workplace, culturally. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited about that because that particular you know, character in history, all of her victims were young women. Mm. So yeah. it's a very extreme example of that, um, that I'm not, and again, it's like, it's too soon to anticipate exactly what direction it will go, but I am just so excited um, by where the, you know, where the research is already pointing me. Yes. And incidentally, I just heard um, Alison Bechtel on the radio today talking about- Oh, that's awesome. Getting older and all this stuff. When I first learned about the Bechtel test, I was like, oh, you know, I, I would have never even thought of that. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's crazy. But then, you're like, oh no, I'm guilty. You through like, the test, you're like, oh my gosh. You're like, none of my movies pass. No, well, I don't even know. I, I think I had a couple that did pass, but there aren't many. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really it's interesting. And, uh, and in relationship to Hungarian, what a difficult language to learn. I understand that it's like as difficult to, and the closest, the, the closest language to Hungarian is Korean. You know, I've heard, yeah, I've heard Korean and also like some type of like old Nordic form mm. of, of language. So yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and I'm definitely like rusty because I have not been practicing it for the okay. last couple months. Um, but yeah, I'm actually going to be reaching out to one of my teachers and letting her know that I'm about to get started on the project. Um, very yeah. Good. So yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, it's, it does. You've got a lot going on. And I just yes. I kind of in closing, um, I don't have any questions from our amazing audience. However, are you going to be painting again? <laughs> Do you still paint? Oh, that, it's, that's like a, a really funny question, too, because, um, yeah, I was I had a had a drink with a, a curator friend and was filling him in on the residency. And then I was like, and I also made some paintings when I was away. I'm like, it's a secret. Don't tell anyone. Um, so yeah, I actually have been thinking about painting um, because again, I think for me, it's like I've I've made other projects, right, that kind of have existed in the realm of painting. And again, people that aren't familiar with my work, if you go on the website, there's like these really intense like butter wall installations that are completely oh, yeah. like didn't even get totally to yeah totally taking a stab at painting um and a lot of different things and then the these oil boxes that were like a great successful answer to being sculptural and painting at the same time and still conceptual but to be honest like after all of this reading that I've been doing and kind of where I'm at in the practice I think I am kind of feeling as much as the the piece that we were just talking about the project that's dealing with female anger and rage I mean that's very conceptually driven um, and not to say that it won't be poetic, but I think where I'm at right now with like the current, uh, the video work from Vienna and I think the response to Ingberg Bachman's work, um, I really wanna go back to her poetry and I do think that there's going to be a, a response that exists to some extent, I think in painting and maybe it'll be a failure, I'm not sure. Um, but I feel like it's something I've got to, to see where it goes because there is a mm -hmm. compulsion there. Um, and it just feels like the right thing for some reason. So yeah, I try to trust my instincts. And like I said, we'll give it a whirl. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Eden Collins has a question if you want to throw that in the sure. chat. 
Um, Would it be possible to just ask it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. I just was realizing it might be a little tricky to type it all. Um, first of all, this is an amazing talk. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I remembered it was happening tonight. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was a child, I saw Bernice Bob's her hair. And, oh, great. Yeah. Sure and I was well. hoping it was in your It case. definitely is. Yeah. I figured it would be. Um, and it stuck with me my whole life. Uh, hair has always been sort of a contentious topic for me mm -hmm. uh, and my family. Um, and I ended up making work where I carved into my own hair because nice. I was sort of trying to rectify being feminine and masculine and, and living in both of those spaces. Um, and so I was just wondering, you had mentioned the sort of female violence against each other mm -hmm. in that piece. It's specifically done in a spiteful means, both characters doing it. So I was just wondering if it had made the cut. So I'm really glad that it did. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mostly just wanted to ask that and, and thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. And and just um, as an anecdote to that, it's, it's also just like interesting, I think like this idea um, of storytelling and versioning, you know, is something that we didn't get to, but that is kind of through my work and that mm -hmm. a lot of authors and filmmakers do, but uh, the Bernice Bob's her hair scene, there's a more contemporary, like a more recent film um, where when I was doing the, like the kind of the final review of this like massive work, um, there's a scene where it's a group of friends and it's a friend who's like, I'm gonna shave my head, I'm gonna shave my head. And so there's the bet and it's totally, mirroring the scene from Bernice Bob's her hair and even part of the dialogue is is mirroring it um where they the in Bernice Bob's her hair the one girl who has her Shelly Duvall's boyfriend is like oh I need to pick up my dry cleaning or something and he's like oh I'll take you and they use the same line in oh. this contemporary film so yes yeah, so it's uh, things like that are always kind of fun to discover um and yeah that was it's a really intense and good scene yeah so thanks for bringing that up yeah yeah, and thank you so much, B. Quinn, for being here with us and for all of our participants that are still on this conversation. Uh, thank you. If you miss anything, I'll have it uploaded on YouTube, hopefully soon. I know that um, other artists that I've worked with that show video in their talk, sometimes the YouTube doesn't like that because of copyright issues. Oh, right. So hopefully it'll um, be okay. If not, we can edit it out. We'll just, yeah, we might have to take that little part out. But if you missed any of it, um, please feel free, you know, go to B. Quinn's site. Um, she's got really amazing stuff. Uh, the works on Art Fair are just gorgeous and uh, very reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm really happy to be here with you this Thursday evening. I'm about to bust into Chelsea, see if I can make some end of these openings mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, in New York myself. But uh, again, B. Quinn, when you're in New York, look us up. Definitely. I'd love to meet you in person. And uh, again, thank you so much for participating in the Art Fair Talks. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. Absolutely. And thanks for everyone for being here. <laughs> yeah. Ciao, everyone. Bye.